Hey, welcome back to graph theory. Um, in this video lecture, we're going to wrap up our work in section 5.2 and chapter 5 all together by looking at some uh, sufficient conditions for Hamiltonicity in a graph. So you remember last time we were talking about uh, some necessary conditions, things that have to be true in any graph that's Hamiltonian. Today we're going to take a look at uh, sufficient conditions, things that if they're true, it's good enough to, to guarantee being Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, there's a lot of these conditions and they, they tend to get a little bit technical. Uh, so we're just going to kind of survey a couple of them here. So I want to show you two sufficient conditions. I'll try to give you complete proofs of them. And then we'll uh, end the lecture by looking at um, an application of this stuff called the traveling salesperson problem. That actually is uh, uh, contained in uh, section 5.3 of the book, and I, I won't I won't really address it. I'm just gonna just kind of mention it, and then if anybody's interested in that, you can you can contact me. I could point you to some more reading about it, uh, or, or we could just take it from there. Okay, so so let's start off with this first condition. Uh, it's kind of a, a specialized thing, but we'll see it has kind of a nice corollary. So the condition, the sufficient condition is that if you have a traceable graph, you have a traceable graph, then its cross product with K2, the complete graph on two vertices, will always be Hamiltonian. So, so if you're traceable, then this cross product is Hamiltonian. So it's a, it's a way to build Hamiltonian graphs. Uh, uh, let me remind you about this cross product construction. Um, you know, to, to speak about it more generally is a little is a little bit more complicated, but for K2, it's actually pretty simple. If you're taking the cross product of a graph with K2, then you take two copies of your graph. I'm gonna index them G upper zero and G upper one. I'll just say G zero and G one. And that index is kind of based on the fact that I'm indexing my vertices in K2 down there with zero and one. So, so what you do when you take the cross product construction is you have to take pairs of vertices. So I take vertices in G, vertices in K2. So my vertices in G are called A, B, C, and D. So the cross product is gonna have things like A0, B0, C0, D0, A1, B1, C1, D1. So there's two copies of G, the zero copy and the one copy. Everything that's adjacent in G stays adjacent in each copy. So, so these cycles are, are the, these edges in G, uh, uh, they're in the cross product graph in both copies in G0 and G1. But then for corresponding edges like this uh, A0 and A1, I have to also include, sorry, that was kind of not helpful highlighting, I think. Maybe I could make it a little bit thinner. So I've still got, in both copies, I've got the four edges that were in G itself. Those are my copies of G. But then in the cross product, you know, when, when the uh, second things are, are uh, or when the first entry is the same, that you also connect. So because zero and one are connected in K2, A0 and A1 get connected, B0 and B1 get connected, and so on. So those are sort of corresponding edges. So there's a little picture of the cross product of G and K2 over there. Okay, cool. So um, if G is traceable, if G is traceable, well then it has some spanning path. That's the definition of traceability. Uh, uh, and that spanning path, uh, even if it's a cycle, if there's a spanning cycle, I'll stop before I return to the original. So, so it has a spanning path with endpoint vertices X and Y that aren't the same. All right, so let's call P0 the copy of that spanning path in G0, and let's call its first and last point X0 and Y0, and then the same for P1, it's in the copy G1, uh, corresponding vertices are X1 and Y1, all right? So then the claim is that in this cross product, here's how you can make a, a Hamiltonian cycle. I've got, I've got it drawn down here, and I'm just gonna sort of draw along with it as I speak. So what do you do? You start off in your G0 copy, and you traverse your, uh, uh, your spanning path. So I start off at my X upper zero, and I traverse my spanning path in G0. I'm gonna end at, at the endpoint Y upper zero. Y upper zero is adjacent to Y upper one in the other copy of G. So then I take that edge, 
and, and then I traverse the spanning path in the other copy of G, but I traverse it in the opposite direction. I go back from Y upper one back to X upper one. And then X upper one and X upper zero are contain are connected in the cross product. So you, you finish off with that and you've got yourself a uh, Hamiltonian cycle in G cross K2. All right, so this is a nice proof because it's actually constructive. It tells you how to build this cycle. Cool. All right, so that's, that's uh, our first condition, is that if you have a traceable graph, either semi-Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian, then this construction lets you build Hamiltonian graphs. Uh, as kind of a quick corollary to it, let me just remind you that uh, the hypercube Q2 is just the cycle C4. It's traceable. It's actually the uh, example, the picture that I drew, uh, a, a graph G that you're still looking at up there is a copy of C4. It's a traceable graph. It's got a Hamiltonian cycle. So therefore, uh, uh, every hypercube by our construction is Hamiltonian because each hypercube is just the previous hypercube cross K2. Yeah, so if Q2 is traceable, then so is Q3 uh, because it's Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian graph is traceable. And then if Q3 is traceable, so is Q4 and so on. So if you want to write a kind of formal induction proof of that, but, but it's, yeah, so, so those hypercubes, which are important graphs in, in data structures, right? Uh, uh, there are those uh, vertices indexed by zeros and ones and you're adjacent if and only if you differ by one place. And so there's lots of applications of those in, in, in data structures. Uh, and uh, uh, those are Hamiltonian graphs. You can traverse around them in an efficient way with no repetition. Okay, cool. So let's move on. We're going to try to chain our way through this, this proof. Uh, the second and, and last that we'll speak about sufficient condition for Hamiltonicity is due to Paul Dirac, a physicist. Dirac proved this in 1952. The proof that I'm going to give you uh, is sort of taken from just sort of explicating, filling in some details from Doug West's uh, graph theory book. Um, you can compare it to the proof in our book, which is basically the same. It's basically the same proof. Same idea. Uh, I think Doug West uh, articulated a little bit better. Okay, so what is the condition? The condition is that if you take a graph that has at least three vertices, uh, and it is the case that every vertex degree is at least half the order of the graph. So I have a graph of order n, every vertex has degree at least n over two, then that graph is Hamiltonian, all right? So it's kind of saying that if, if, if every vertex has at least as many neighbors as half the order of the graph, then you can always find a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, Professor West's proof. Uh, uh, this condition that n is greater than or equal to three is, is a little bit annoying, but it has to be there because K2 is not a Hamiltonian graph. Uh, K2 doesn't have a cycle. K2 is a tree. It's K2 is semi-Hamiltonian, but it's not Ham Hamiltonian. Uh, but it does satisfy this degree condition because the degree of, of every vertex in K2 is one and one is at least one. So we have to have that in there. Okay, and we're gonna proceed by contradiction. I'm gonna proceed by a contradiction. So suppose, contrary to the theorem, that we have some graph uh, uh, it, it satisfies that the degree of every vertex is half the order, but it's not Hamiltonian, okay? So suppose I have some non-Hamiltonian graph that satisfies the hypothesis of this theorem, okay? So here's a little bit of a sophisticated part of the argument. Um, if I add edges to a graph, I cannot reduce the minimum degree of any vertex. So if I took this graph, this non-Hamiltonian graph that satisfies that degree condition and I stuck edges into it, it would still satisfy that degree condition. So I'm gonna assume that my graph is maximal non-Hamiltonian. It's a maximal non-Hamiltonian graph with that degree condition. So what do I mean by that? I, I've tried to write it down here uh, in blue again. So by maximal non-Hamiltonian, what I mean is that I've got a non-Hamiltonian graph, it satisfies our degree condition, but if you stuck any edge into that graph, if you added so much as one edge, it would be Hamiltonian. It, it, it would not be not Hamiltonian anymore. <laughs> so it will be Hamiltonian, so it'll have a spanning cycle. So this, I think, is the useful way to think about what we're talking about, is that without loss of generality, I can assume that I've got a graph 
It's not Hamiltonian. Its degree of every vertex is at least n over two. But if you add a single edge to that graph, you're going to create a spanning cycle. So it's maximal non-Hamiltonian. Okay, so pause that uh, and digest it if you need to, or just come with me. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so take a couple of vertices in this graph that are not adjacent to each other. Okay, so take a couple of vertices in this graph that aren't adjacent to each other. The degree uh, uh, a condition, um, does it guarantee that that's true? Uh, we'll worry about why our graph isn't complete here in a little while. But take take a couple of vertices that aren't adjacent to each other. Okay. So because of this maximality condition, um, this graph G has to have a spanning path. It has to have a spanning path. So why do I know that? Because if I put this edge UV into G, it has to have a spanning cycle. It has to have a spanning cycle. So if I just ignore that edge UV, every other edge is in the graph G, and it would be a path starting at U and ending at V. Uh, I just take the edge UV out of the spanning cycle, and you're left with a spanning path, OK? So, so I have this spanning path that starts at U, uh, I'm just calling for index purposing u equal to v1, and then I go to v2, and so on. Uh, the graph has order n, so there are n vertices uh, uh, on this path because it's a spanning path, and I'm just calling the last one vn. All right? Good. So every spanning cycle in g plus uv has to contain the edge uv, so I have to have this path in g. The spanning path is actually in g. Here I've drawn a little picture of it. So there's our picture P. Let me make this uh, a little thinner as we narrate. So uh, my path starts at U. U is called V1. It ends at V. V is called Vn. V1 to Vn is every single vertex in this graph because uh, that path is a spanning path. All right. So now I've written something in red there that may not be true. I'm going to try to convince you it's true. But for a moment, just focus on my if. I'm just saying if there was a neighbor of V, some, or sorry, of U, something adjacent to U, and it directly followed a neighbor of V on this path. So, so here you can see I've got a neighbor of U, it's connected to a vertex called VI plus one, and VI plus one is directly following VI, which is a neighbor of V, okay? So I'm just saying, suppose that were true. Suppose that were true. Let me get rid of those things. They were just to help us see. Then I claim that this thing is a spanning cycle. And, and let me just sort of outline it. You can read the notation if you want down there. But what do I mean it's a spanning cycle? Start at U and cruise to the vertex VI. Yeah? And then follow your old spanning path to the vertex V. Then take that edge that goes back to VI's predecessor, or VI plus one's predecessor, VI, and then follow the front half of that path backwards back to U. Okay, that will be a cycle. It began and ended at U, and it's a spanning cycle. It hit every vertex. It hit every vertex once. So, so if there is a neighbor of U directly following a neighbor of V on this spanning path, then I've got a contradiction because I can make a spanning cycle in G, and G is supposed to be a non-Hamiltonian graph, okay? So fair enough question is, well, why would such a U and V exist? Uh, I have to accept this question because I kind of derived my contradiction from a great big if, you know, suppose those things have to be there. So here's how uh, uh, Professor West convinced me, and I'm going to try to convince you that such a U or such a VI and VI plus one have to exist. They have to. Okay. So let's just try to move through the idea here. So we're trying to answer the question: Why? Why would such a special thing have to happen? So let me define a couple sets. First set S is just those indices. So I is a number between one and n such that u times a vertex called vi plus one uh, uh, is an edge in g. Okay, so uh, notice really all s is is the indices uh, of things that are adjacent to u and I'm just calling them vi plus ones. Uh, 
uh, uh, but, but, but in particular, the size of that set is just the degree of u, that's at least n over two. And I want to point out that s doesn't have everything in it, in, in particular, n doesn't belong to s, because there is no such vertex uh, of vn plus one. It's, it's not in there. So, so the index n does not belong to the set s. Okay, so s is sort of the indices of vertices along this path that are adjacent to u, and in particular, uh, uh, the, the vertex has the index that's one more than i, yeah? So I just kind of look one i at a time and ask, is vi plus one adjacent to u? And if it is, I throw i and s. Cool. The number of times I answer that question is gonna be the degree of u. All right. Same thing, but I do it call the set T, count up the indices where V, the vertex V, the other endpoint of this path, is adjacent to something called VI. All right. The number of such things will be the degree of V, that's at least n over two. Uh, uh, and oops, n is not in T. I'm glad I caught that. N is not in T. Uh, uh, because, well, uh, Vn is not adjacent to itself. This graph has no loops. We don't, we don't allow that. It's a graph. Okay? So I have these two sets of indices, and I, and they, and I know their sizes, and I know that the uh, index n is not in either one of them. Cool. Okay, a little combinatoric fact. If you take the size of a finite set and add it to the size of another finite set, subtract off the number of elements that are in both, that'll tell you the number of elements that are in the union. That's a counting principle. Yeah, you take what's in S plus what's in T, subtract what you double counted, and that'll tell you what's in S or T. And if I solve that equation a little bit, I just added S intersect T to both sides. It says that the size of the union plus the size of the intersection is the size of the two sets summed. And we said above that each one of those things was at least n over two. So it shows me that that sum is, is at least n. Yeah, what sum? The union plus the intersection is at least n, okay? Non-negative numbers that sum to at least n. But we know that n itself is not in the union, right? Uh, 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 we said, I'm going to just do it in a different color to emphasize it, n is not in S, n is not in T. Okay, well, that means it's not in S or T. It's not in the union. It's not in S and it's not in T. So De Morgan's Law say it's not in the union. So um, if this union plus the intersection has to be at least n, but the union itself, uh, uh, it, it can't be n because it's missing something, well, then the intersection has to have at least one element in it. <clears throat> yeah, so this is kind of the cool part of, of Professor West's proof. Why would we care that there's some index in S and T? Well, we care a lot because if the index I is in S, well, that means that um, I need to fix a little typo down here, sorry. If the, the index I is in S, it means that U vi plus one belongs to the edge set of g and if the index i belongs to t that means that v vi belongs to uh, uh, the edge set t so in other words the fact that there's an index in both of these sets means that we really do have this if there has to be a neighborhood or a neighbor of u that directly follows a neighbor of v along our path and so we can put together that uh, uh, cycle and get our contradiction. All right, so that is a proof of Dirac's sufficient condition for Hamiltonicity. Uh, that condition is not necessary. Uh, we can take a, a quick uh, uh, look at an example here. If you take, say, a cycle, I think a, a cycle of, of length at least five, it doesn't have to be uh, a five, but uh, that's certainly Hamiltonian. Yeah, a cycle is a Hamiltonian graph. Uh, uh, it has a Hamiltonian cycle. The degree of every vertex on a cycle is two. In particular, it's a true for every vertex. But the order of the cycle is five, and five uh, over two is two and a half, and two is not, not bigger than two and a half, not bigger than or equal to two and a half. So Dirac's sufficient condition isn't necessary. There are Hamiltonian graphs that don't have that property. 
That's not what Dirac claimed. Dirac just claimed anything with that property will be Hamiltonian. Cool. Okay, so uh, uh, let's wrap up this video lecture. We can talk more about this in class, but this is an application that actually is written about in section 5.3. I won't, I won't make a specific video for section 5.3, but, but uh, uh, let's just, it's just kind of a place, uh, and, and you can take this context and, and apply it uh, uh, to, to many other kind of networks or whatever, but I'm gonna talk about this traditional sort of what people call the traveling salesperson, sorry, that's one word, salesperson problem. So what do salespeople do? Uh, well, um, they, they, these salespeople anyway, they travel around to different cities and they want to sell uh, whatever it is they're selling. Um, and uh, uh, they would like to leave their home base and travel around to each one of their cities and return to their home base, and they want to travel around to each one of their cities once. So if we kind of make a graph by associating vertices to cities, and then edges are routes between them, so, so you draw an edge between two cities if you can directly move from one of those cities to another, uh, well, then they're trying to find a Hamiltonian cycle in this, in this graph. Uh, they want to visit each vertex once and return to where they came. So, so uh, typically in, in, the, in the actual traveling sales problem that people talk about, these uh, graphs would be weighted. They would be weighted be, uh, uh, and the uh, weight that we associate to each edge is the travel time. So the actual traveling salesperson problem is find a route that visits all cities once and minimizes the traveling time. So you don't want just any Hamiltonian cycle, you want a minimum weight Hamiltonian cycle. So I didn't write it out here in this lecture and I'm not going to, but in, in section 5.3, the author uh, uh, walks you through uh, finding a minimum weight Hamiltonian cycle on a weighted graph uh, just by brute force finding all possible Hamiltonian cycles and then checking the weight of each one of them. Um, so uh, uh, you guys can read a little bit more about this. Uh, finding minimum weight Hamiltonian cycles in terms of complexity, uh, it is an NP-complete problem. It was proven to be NP-complete in 1975. So in terms of computational complexity, it's, it's not... Um, well, it's not NP hard uh, or NP incomplete. Uh, so, so algorithms can crunch it out uh, in polynomial time if, if I understand what NP complete means. But uh, that's one, just, I'm just mentioning this uh, as an example of like where, where would people uh, uh, want to think about such things? Well, yeah, maybe you want to think about this. Like how, how do I get everywhere in my network uh, minimizing something. Maybe it's traveling time, maybe it's expense or something like that. But uh, uh, so there's all kinds of variations. Um, I think I'll just mention here, maybe one of you will ask me about it in an office hour. I don't, I don't know much about it, but we could do some Googling and learn about it together. Is There's also interesting problems if you play chess and you're familiar with uh, the chess piece called the Rook or sometimes the Knight. It has a very specific movement pattern. Uh, uh, and there's a, a problem in chess called the Knight's Tour that kind of asks if you can start uh, from some place on the chessboard, uh, moving uh, the way the knight can move uh, and visit every square on the chessboard. Uh, uh, and so that's the Knight's Tour problem. And that problem, graph theoretically, is, is a Hamiltonian cycle problem as well. Okay, so thanks for listening. And I will see you uh, maybe in the Zoom meeting class or, uh, I don't know, in some other online format.